Hi everyone. Welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilovepathology.com. In continuation with the series of the diseases of heart, we were discussing about ischemic heart disease, right? In the part one, this is the part two of ischemic heart disease, where we will understand a very important topic in diseases of heart, that's myocardial infarction. And let's concentrate on the pathogenesis and a bit about myocardial injury pattern in this session. So what is myocardial infarction? I'm sure you all might have heard about the word heart attack, right? Yes, this is the death of cardiac muscle due to prolonged ischemia. Right? When we talk about epidemiology of myocardial infarction, this can occur virtually at any age. Around 10% of myocardial infarctions occur in people younger than 40 years of age, whereas around 45% occur in people younger than 65 years of age. Having said this, the prevalence of myocardial infarction increases with age, and men are most commonly affected than women particularly in the reproductive years where women are affected during the reproductive years because of the presence of estrogen. But this protection is lost in the postmenopausal women. The incidence of myocardial you know, infarction in women is higher in the postmenopausal women. Now, in the earlier session, we had discussed about the three important blood vessels, the three important coronary blood vessels which are implicated in the myocardial infarctions are the left and the right coronary artery. This is the right coronary artery that is the left anterior descending coronary artery and this is the left circumflex artery. Right? So, in 90% of the cases of myocardial infarction, the cause is obstructive atherosclerotic lesions in the epicardial coronary arteries. So, these arteries are situated in the epicardium. So, the reason is obstructive atherosclerotic lesions involving in any of these three major coronary arteries. Most common inciting agent for the obstruction of these coronary blood vessels are the erosion of atherosclerotic plates. Now, why does this erosion occur? And that's because of either endothelial injury or because of intraplaque hemorrhage or mechanical forces. Once there is erosion of these atherosclerotic plaques, what happens is that there is exposure of subendothelial collagen as well as necrotic plaque content into the blood. Now, once there is exposure of subendothelial collagen that results in adherence and aggregation of platelets, along with aggregation, there is activation of platelets, which leads to release of thromboxane A2, adenosine diphosphate, and serotonin. So, release of these mediators result in further aggregation of platelets and vasospasm. So, this is one way of causing aggregation and vasospasm. Simultaneously, there is another pathway which gets activated is activation of tissue factor which leads to coagulation cascade leading on to further platelet aggregation and vasospasm. All these things result in growth of the existing thrombus which finally leads to luminal occlusion. And we know that once there is a luminal occlusion, it results in reduction of the blood supply and finally myocardial necrosis. So, these obstructive atherosclerotic lesions accounts for 90% of cases. So, the remaining 10% of cases could be because of coronary emboli, be because of vascular spasm or myocardial vessel inflammation. See, the cause for coronary emboli or the origin of coronary emboli could be from the left atrium in association with atrial fibrillation or it could be from mural thrombus, vegetations or even prosthetic material. Vascular spasm most often are drug induced, for example, cocaine or disciplin. Myocardial vessel inflammation, meaning vasculitis, myocardial vessel vasculitis can also result in reduction of blood supply leading on to myocardial infarction. Other not very common causes include myeloidosis, sickle cell disease, to be shock, or even dissection of iota. Very rarely, even congenital anomalous origin of a coronary artery can be a cause of myocardial infarction. 
Now, once there is myocardial ischemia because of obstruction of the coronary blood vessels, now what would be the response of the myocardium? The first and the foremost thing is that there is tissue oxygenation which is extremely reduced leading on to decrease in the production of ATP which we saw while we you know, learnt about the cell injury, right? And that is the earliest biochemical change. Myocardial ischemia also reduces the removal of metabolic waste products leading on to accumulation of lactic acid and it also reduces the availability of nutrients and oxygen which further is the reason for decreased myocardial contractility. And because of decreased myocardial contractility, there will be evidence of systolic dysfunction much before the death of the myocardial fibers. Let's quickly understand what could be the ultrastructural changes in these myocardial fibers. Initially, there will be myofibrillar relaxation, will be glycogen depletion and cell or mitochondrial swelling. You know, all these things occur within few minutes where you will not have any gross manifestation or the microscopic features. These are ultrastructural features and to this stage, the condition is reversible. Okay, once the oxygen or the blood supply is restored, everything comes back to normalcy. Now, if there is severe ischemia, severe ischemia meaning blood flow which is less than 10% of normal blood flow and the duration of severe ischemia is around 20 to 30 minutes or even longer, then what happens is the irreversibility of the injury leading on to myocardial necrosis. Okay? Now, it takes at least 20 minutes for the myocardium to die. So, that is the importance of time. You have 20 minutes of time to save your myocardium. And it's very important to diagnose that the person is having myocardial infarction before it results in cell death. And that is the reason why a rapid diagnosis is extremely important in the case of suspected myocardial infarction. Let's try to understand in the time frame as to what are all the things which can happen once there is obstruction, right? So, within seconds, there is onset of ATP depletion because ATP levels drop very rapidly due to lack of oxygen for energy production. In less than two minutes, there will be loss of contractility. That's what I told you earlier because myocytes lose their ability to contract and that leads to impaired heart function. In 10 minutes of time, ATP is reduced to 50% of normal which significantly affects the cell metabolism. In around 40 minutes of time, ATP is reduced to around 10% of normal which means there is severe energy depletion which increases the risk of irreversibility. And there is no fixed time as to when the irreversibility starts, it's around 20 to 40 minutes where the cell membrane damage occurs leading on to leakage of all the cellular contents. And if it is beyond one hour, then the microvascular injury also begins. Okay, And that's because of you know damage to small blood vessels which further worsens the ischemia. So, this is what happens in the myocardium once there is obstruction, significant obstruction. Now, what is the earliest detectable feature of myocardial necrosis? Let's understand this. To begin with, there is loss of integrity of the sarcolemal membrane, which means the integrity of sarcolemal membrane of the myocardium is disrupted, which leads to leakage of the intracellular macromolecules. The macromolecules, for example, troponin and CKMB, these macromolecules leak into the interstitium and then from the interstitium it goes to the microvasculature and lymphatics. This is the concept behind the early diagnosis of myocardial infarction. You ask the patient to get the troponin levels and that is the earliest evidence of myocardial necrosis. So, detection of irreversible myocardial damage is possible when you detect these intracellular macromolecules in the circulation. Now, let us see the location of infarct. Say, for example, you have an obstructive lesion or an atherosclerotic plaque which has ruptured and has caused obstruction of the left anterior descending coronary artery. 
if there is an obstruction somewhere here then this is the area which is at risk right so to begin with the first part of the heart which suffers from irreversible damage is the subendocardium so if there is an obstruction if this is the endocardium that's myocardium and that is epicardium so the first to suffer irreversible damage is the subendocardium right the reason for that is the subendocardial tissue is the last to receive the blood from the epicardial blood vessels the second important reason is that there is high intramural pressure which basically restricts the blood flow so if there is prolonged ischemia what really happens is there is infarct of the subendocardial region so that's the subendocardial infarct if there is no intervention at this stage there is progression of infarct and that progression is because of the presence of reactive oxygen species could be because of tissue edema and lots of inflammatory mediators which usually occurs in around 3 to 6 hours where the subendocardial infarct gets converted to a full thickness infarct you know the cell death spreads outward from the subendocardial region to the other layers of heart okay and finally there is a full thickness infarct or it's also referred to as transmural infarct let us quickly understand the differences between subendocardial and transmural infarcts subendocardial infarcts can be patchy it can also be multifocal sometimes it can be circumferential we'll talk about that for example see, look at this if there is a partial obstruction here as such the subendocardium is the last one to receive the blood supply and because of the partial obstruction this part of the heart is infarcted and that's the subendocardial infarct subendocardial infarct can also be circumferential when there is global hypoperfusion which means when the patient is in shock there is severe reduction of the blood to the myocardium by these coronary blood vessels so there is a circumferential infarct very rarely because of micro infarcts within the myocardial blood vessels you can have intramural infarcts so both subendocardial infarct and intramural infarcts are referred to as non transmural infarcts now moving on to transmural infarct they are often solid they are unifocal and they are present in the distribution of the specific coronary artery you can see that if this is a coronary artery which is obstructed the distribution of the infarct is restricted to the area of the blood supply which it receives from that particular artery right so similarly you can see that these are transmural infarcts as i mentioned subendocardial infarcts often due to hypotension or shock whereas transmural infarct because the whole myocardium is involved at least that part of the myocardium is involved which can lead to shock there is no weakening of the wall in the case of subendocardial infarct and then they do not form aneurysms because there is no weakening or they do not lead to ventricular rupture whereas in transmural infarct it can result in aneurysms or can lead to ventricular rupture so these are the basic differences between subendocardial and the transmural infarcts the most important part of understanding the myocardial infarction is to understand the gross and microscopic features which we will study in detail in the next video so till now we discussed in detail about the epidemiology the pathogenesis and the various myocardial injury pattern in myocardial infarction right thank you for watching if you have like this video hit the like button do comment if you have anything to ask if you find this video useful please consider subscribing and then please do share thank you